So this course is set up as a series of projects that are designed to take you from you know, opening and saving and just the basics of working with files all the way through some really nice uh, retouching on some portraits and even some basic compositing stuff. So there's an asset uh, pack that you should download. So the links to download that will be in the information for the first project lesson. Um, so make sure you get those. There are a couple links to a few of the stock sites that I like to pull from as well. So those are free stock sites. You can use those images for uh, your own commercial work as well. So um, make sure you get all of that because the process of working through files with someone is uh, much more effective, I've found, than just watching some random tutorial that uh, just kind of talks about things, but you're not actually practicing doing it. And that's one of the key aspects of this is really practice working with these tools and spend some time on your own images playing with some of the stuff we talk about. But working and practicing on the same files that you see me working on will help you develop those skills a lot faster. Okay, without getting too long-winded about everything, I do want to go over um, just a few basic things about the uh, Photoshop interface, and then we'll dive into that first project. So let's get going. When you first open Photoshop, you'll be greeted with this uh, splash screen. They call it the home screen. Um, and it may not look exactly the same for you. Like all these down here are recent files that I've worked on and some of these are actually part of this course. You'll see them later on. Um, but you may not, if you've never opened Photoshop and done anything, you may not have anything at all down here. Uh, but on the left side, we have the home screen, which is where you're at. Learn button will take you to some Adobe's tutorials and things like that. Um, and then you have new file and open. Uh, for this demonstration, I'm just going to click on new file and it comes up with a whole lot of presets and different things like that. Really don't worry about any of that right now, although let's go to the photo tab and just use default 7x5 Photoshop size. If you, if you don't see that right away or whatever, just pick anything that sounds reasonable for you. But it really, I'm just opening this to show you how the Photoshop interface looks. And again, it may not be exactly like this for you if you've done any adjustments, but I think this is pretty much the default. I think I've added in the uh, character and paragraph tabs here, but just for your benefit, if you're really new to Photoshop and are just like, oh my gosh, I don't even know where anything's at. How do I even get started? Obviously, this big white thing is your basic uh, working space. This is where an image is at if you open an image. Um, but on the left side, we have our toolbox. So things like the paintbrush, our healing brush, the move tool, and paint buckets, and zoom tools, and text tools are all included on here. So these are the basic tools of drawing and editing images in Photoshop. And I'll tell you this, 85 to 90% of everything that I do is just with a paintbrush. And there's different ways to set up different paintbrushes and you can customize things and all that kind of stuff. It's really cool. But it's one of the most powerful tools that you have for working on an image. Along the top is your standard uh, file menu. Um, again, it may be a little bit of variation between PC and a Mac. I work on a PC, so you'll hear me talk about keyboard shortcuts. A lot of keyboard shortcuts in Photoshop, things like Control J for me on a Mac, that's the command button and J that duplicates layers and we'll get into that later, but those are kind of keyboard shortcuts that really help you work a lot faster in Photoshop. Um, but this menu across the top, you know, you have your file, your edit, image. So this menu has a lot of the basic automatic color toning and contrast that you can do, image sizing, rotation, and adjustments around hue and saturation. Um, and you can desaturate it and make it black and white, all that kind of stuff. Layer menu has layer options and operations. Type is for type, obviously. 
selecting if you want to select the people in your in your image and do different things you can select based on a color range this is a, a very powerful way and honestly I don't use the menu stuff up here a lot because we'll get into things called adjustment layers and some of the select tools but these all are up here um, filters are fantastic for doing special effects um, blurring creating noise sharpening all these kinds of things as well as your Adobe Camera Raw filter is available in here as well and we'll talk about the difference between a JPEG and a raw file and how Photoshop treats those but you can also edit any image as if it were a raw file using the raw filters now a JPEG image won't let you push things quite as far as a raw file will because it's compressed there's less information to work with but you can still use the same tools and create some cool things there. There is a 3D workspace, although some versions of Photoshop are starting to get away from that. Um, view, plugins, window, not really worried about too much of that, but in your window uh, menu are where all of these other panels that are on the right side live. So if you are you know, hunting for uh, something that isn't open over here, you want to go over to the window and look for it in this section. So adjustments are the adjustment layers. And right now for me, that is hiding inside of this middle group. So it showed, it defaulted to properties. The adjustments is the next tab over. Libraries is a collection of color th things that you can put together yourself. Um, like I have my my photography brand colors selected in here don't worry about that for now um, but this adjustments is something that we will get into using a whole lot and you can resize these if you hover between them to where you get that up and down pointer you can resize the different panels that are working together here and you can pull them out and undock them and move them around and put it in different places if you want to kind of where it highlights like that so it drops in there um, don't mess around with that too much but just to give you a quick demonstration that you can rearrange all of that and if you get it all screwed up and really messed up um, you go back to the worst workspace and you can reset the essentials workspace so that's where I'm working at right now. I have my own custom one here set up, but for the purposes of demonstrating to uh, everybody who is brand new to Photoshop, I went to the Essentials workspace. You can reset it in there with that selection. Okay. A couple quick edits on our preferences. So if you go to the edit menu and go to the preferences at the bottom and in this general group, It'll open up this window and you can see all the other ones that, are, that were there are available as well. This right here, auto show the home screen. If you don't like that home screen that popped up when we first launched Photoshop, you can turn that off here. And if you also are used to older versions of Photoshop, you can use a legacy new document interface. That's where we went to select the photos five by seven or seven by five Photoshop photo the old version of that is a little more menu based and it doesn't have all the icons all over the place so depending on your preferences there you can change it um, the other one I want to take a look at is in tools and I like using the zoom with the scroll wheel so the scroll wheel in the middle of your mouse assuming you have one um, you can scroll in and out and zoom in and out on your image using that so that's uh, a lot easier for me at least to work with but again you can set that to your preference and i don't want to go much further than that any of this there's a whole lot of stuff here don't do, don't get too caught up in that but you're welcome to look through that and see what might you know pique your interest but those are kind of the two main things that uh, a lot of people ask me about is how do i turn off this home screen and and how do i zoom with my scroll wheel because mine's not doing it so that's a basic little look at the overall workspace that we'll be working in um one other thing i do want to mention is using an editing pen tablet something like this and i have a little sticker on here that says the caffeine made me do it because you know caffeine it's good stuff um but this is a wacom intuos 4 i don't know how you say it it's wacom wacom something like that i just say wacom um but this is actually a 
10 year old editing tablet it comes with a little pen stylus the great thing about these is you can do um, it's much more natural as far as drawing but it also has pressure sensitivity and one of the things we'll I'll demonstrate later on in the portrait editing is using that that pressure sensitivity to help edit hair you can make really nice looking hair and wispy little things that look realistic using the pressure sensitivity of these pens so they can be a little bit uh, difficult to get used to at first if you're absolutely have never used anything like that and um, aren't really familiar with just drawing and sketching a lot on your own um, it may take some time I always recommend give it a solid week of working with that pen tablet before you decide it's just not something that you want to use um, it can take that long to get accust accustomed to how it works but highly recommend it there will be a link uh, in in this video's description as well to um, Amazon it is an affiliate link so if you purchase through that it doesn't cost you anything extra but it does give me a little bit of an extra benefit to doing these kinds of videos so feel free to take a look at that highly recommend getting one there are other brands Huion uh, is is one that I'm familiar with and they make a great product as well so I'll probably link one of theirs as well um, but with all that said let's dive into the first project and actually start working in Photoshop all right welcome to your very first Photoshop project or if you've done other things the first one in this course make sure if you haven't already there's a link in the description for this video to download the asset pack for this whole course um, you want to make sure you go ahead and get those because first thing we're gonna do is grab one of those files and open up the file so um, you should be able to just download that save it somewhere convenient on your computer your desktop if you've got a drive that you like to store those things on just make sure you know where you're saving it because we want to go open a file so if you haven't pause this go download it and get ready so we're going to go to open and you want to navigate to wherever you saved your resource pack for this course and open up this Indianapolis skyline image so now you are taken into the main interface of Photoshop and if, if you've done any adjustments to the way this is arranged it may not look exactly like this um, and we'll go through some of the ways that I suggest setting this up in the uh, workspace section but for right now you don't really have to do any of that basically what we're gonna do with this is just make some quick automatic toning adjustments and then save the file just to get you used to how that operates within the image so if you go up to the image menu there are these three auto tone auto contrast and auto color and that's a basic way of letting Photoshop make its best guess for adjusting those three things within your image so let's just say okay auto tone what's that do not a whole lot you can, it kind of looks a little bit cooler if you use command or control Z that's the undo so you can see what that looks like let's go auto contrast that's even less of a change okay uh, undo that control Z command Z on a Mac auto color okay pretty simple adjustments and again I wasn't really necessarily showing this to wow you with the power of Photoshop but this way it gives you okay there's a basic attempt at Photoshop making some adjustments to this to, to enhance the image say we have our own idea on what we want to do with that image adjustments these are all different things that you can do with that image now without getting too crazy on you let's start with hue and saturation because that is one that you will use most often for adjusting colors and saturation in your image if you want to you can completely desaturate it and make it black and white so that's an option down here uh, there's there's a lot of other things in here but let's just click on hue and saturation again that's in the image adjustments section and hue and saturation 
So it brings up this window. And this is how Photoshop works. You have different things where you'll bring up these different sliders, hue, saturation, and lightness, or luminance. There's different terms for a lot of, the, a lot of these things. Um, if you look actually in your color wheel, it's hue, saturation, and B for brightness or black point. All these kinds of terminologies and everything are more or less interchangeable. There's some specifics, but we don't need to get into that. Basically, lightness controls how light or dark your image is. So if you bring it all the way up here, it washes that out and you have a white image. Beautiful. Okay. Saturation does what it sounds like. You can take the saturation way over the top and make it look like some funky 70s poster or desaturate it like we were talking about on the other menu item up there. Or you can change the hues and make it look like it's some alien weird thing. I don't really want to do anything that extreme, but let's just desaturate it a little bit and bring it yeah, a little bit darker. No major reason why, other than that's just what I feel like doing at this point. Now there are some other options in here. There's Colorize, which basically creates a monotone color wash over the entire image. So monochromatic, whatever you want to call it. Um, so if you wanted to do something like that, that is always a good option. Um, and again, you can play with the lightness and darkness of that as well. I'm going to uncheck that and then in this master section, and this is where you actually run into some of the power of Photoshop you have different channels that you can work on. So, reds, yellows, greens, cyans, blues, and magentas. Now, maybe I wanna just kinda desaturate the grass a little bit. You might think, okay, let's go in here in the greens menu and pull down the saturation, and it doesn't really do a whole lot. That's because, in all reality, most of what's in grass the greens of grass is actually in the yellow content of the spectrum. So if you bring down the saturation on the yellows, you're killing all the saturation or most of the saturation. There is still a little bit of green in there. So if you really want to desaturate all of it, you want to do both yellow and green. But you can see that pretty much took out all of the yellow, but it also hit the, the sun set, sunrise. This is actually a sunrise. Hmm. So, you know, those kinds of adjustments you got to be a little bit careful with and we'll get into when we talk about layers and adjustment layers, how you can actually accomplish isolating just the grass versus the sun and changing those, um, the saturation of those independently with adjustment layers and masking those out. So. We'll just go with, okay, we're going to pull that down a little bit so it's a little desaturated, but there's still some of the green there, and just click OK. So, maybe I'm good with that, maybe not. Uh, maybe I want to go back and say, uh, now that I did, did that and just left it, I want to actually target the blues of the sky and just really make those uber powerful whatever. You might change the color of them a little bit if you want to. Eh, not too much. Lightness, darkness. Uh, sometimes with lightness and darkness it does some weird things because it just doesn't quite target it the way you think it should. Um, and then we'll go with that. But you can see it's it's hitting these signs and the, the big building here. Um, Again, maybe I don't want that, and we'll talk about that in the layering section coming up next. But let's just say, okay, we're good with that for now. I want to file, save as, and we're just going to leave it as a JPEG, Indianapolis Skyline, edit one, and click save. Now, you may run into depending on version of Photoshop you're running and how your preferences are set up, where it won't let you just save as, you have to save a copy. 
And again, that's an option that's in the preferences, the, the legacy save as. Because of the Mac OS, but this is about three years ago, they made some changes and it really messed with how things are allowed to save files within the Macintosh operating system. So Adobe went with this as a workaround and it really blew some people's minds for a, a little while because they weren't used to how it made you save a copy of an image. But you can change that in the preferences and again, we go through that in the preferences section of this, but for now, you have your image saved. So if you close this, you should now see in the home screen your Indianapolis Skyline edit and the original as well. And then in your files where you have these saved, you should have your original Indianapolis Skyline image and the edit that we just did like so. Okay, great. Awesome. So after that, let's actually dive into what are layers? What are adjustment layers? What's masking and how does that all that work? So we're gonna take this project and go through the same adjustments to talk about how we can control the saturation adjustments a little bit better with the power of adjustment layers. Okay, so for layers. Let's go ahead and open up the original Indianapolis Skyline image. If you still have this home screen open, you can just click on that and it will bring it up. And you should have down here in the bottom section, the layers panel. And then here in the middle, if you haven't done anything to your interface, will be properties and adjustments. So I always like to have adjustments available because these are your adjustment layers, which are the same thing that we did up here when we went to image adjustments and all this stuff. Those are all available in here. However, as an adjustment layer, this is where you get into non-destructive editing because this will let you make those adjustments in a way that doesn't actually change anything in the base image layer. So, okay, what's a layer? Well, if you ever seen the movie Iron Man, there's a, a scene where um, the bad guys who trapped Iron Man in the cave are going back through his blueprints and they stack like three or four together and rearrange them and then you can actually see all the way through because he's drawn on different sheets of paper different aspects of the design for his original Iron Man suit. So they got these all arranged and then once they line up you can actually see the entire thing. Well each layer of paper with a drawing on it is essentially what Photoshop is doing with layers. So when you just have an image that you've opened, all you have in the layers panel is this background layer. Now there's a couple button eh, there's a couple buttons across the bottom like this. This is create a new layer. So if you click that You'll see there's just this thing. Nothing changes in the image, but there's this thing with an icon that looks like a checkerboard, and it says layer one. Okay, cool. Well, what's that mean? Well, right now this means we have a layer above our base image that we could work on and add things to, but there's nothing in it. So this transparency, this little checkerboard, white and gray checkerboard pattern is Photoshop's way of indicating it's just transparent. There's nothing there. But if we grab our paintbrush, so come over here on the left side, there's tools about halfway down, a little, a little bit above halfway, you should see a brush tool. Just click on that. You don't have to worry right now about any of the settings up here or anything else. And, whatever color you have. If you want to make a specific color, you can do that. But then we just, okay, make a whatever swoosh shape. And you think, oh, well that looks terrible. And that's, f <laughs> yeah, fine. But you can see this layer, it's hard to see, but there's now this little purple swoosh thing that you just drew uh, should kind of show up in the icon of that layer. Now click the eyeball next to it that little coloring thing that you just did went away because you turned off the visibility of the layer that is above your background layer. Okay, great. Turn it back on. Now, layer masking 
lets you hide areas of a layer by painting on a, another icon or another section of that layer. And the masking, to create a layer mask, you want to click this button down at the bottom that is add a layer mask. It looks like a white rectangle with a circle punched out of the middle of it. So if you click that while you have your layer one selected that we drew on, you can see another little icon shows up next to the base layer image icon. There's this little chain in the middle of it that just means they're linked together. We'll talk about that later, but what is, what is this new little icon? That as a layer mask lets you, if you select that, you can draw in here to, well, I'm gonna say erase, but you're not actually erasing. You're just hiding any portion of the layer that you're working on. And you can see if you had a color selected, this automatically goes to black and white because a layer mask only works in black and white and shades of gray because black if you paint black it will completely hide whatever you paint over with if you paint with i'm going to click on the black now i'm going to use this to just pick a mid gray and now if i paint over there you can see it's just reducing the opacity of the area where I just painted because black pure black will hide it completely pure white if you switch these over here there's this little little right angle arrow thing that switches your foreground and background colors that you're working with now if I paint white it brings back what I had hidden or brings back completely the area that I had drawn in gray so Pure black will completely hide it. Pure white will completely show it. Anything in between gray will reduce the opacity of it based on how dark or light that gray is. Lighter gray shows more of it because it's closer to white. Darker gray shows less or hides it more because it's dark, it's closer to pure black. You with me? So again, you can click the reset button on your colors here so it brings white to the foreground and black to the background. Um, and just, you know, play with that a little bit, click different things and you can switch it quickly if you want to by hitting the X key on your keyboard so that jumps back and forth between your foreground and, and background colors really fast. And when you get into compositing, this is one of the things that we will do a lot of work with because if you're working on the mask of somebody that you've cut out of an image and you want to get that edge just perfect right up into the corner of an armpit or fabric or something like that, you can use black to hide it and you paint like that, but then you switch to white and you bring back just enough of it to get the shape that you need to show through and make it look like it's a good cutout of somebody that you're putting into another image. So just play with that for a little bit, going back and forth between black and white and, and whatever on the little swoosh that you've colored here. But I just want you to get familiar with the fact that this mask is hiding or revealing just this layer that you've colored on. And we still have our original image background layer it hasn't been changed one bit, okay? Now, once you're done, you can pause the video and go haywire, whatever you wanna do. Uh, but once you're done with that, what we're gonna do next is create another layer and we're gonna add some text and maybe switch some things around and start working with how this interacts with the background image. So I'm just gonna turn off the visibility of this layer because we don't really want that. It was just a nonsense demonstration, but I'm going to create a new layer. Again, this button down here at the bottom with the plus sign in the middle. Go over to your text tool, horizontal type text. And again, not sure how this is going to show up for you because it just defaults to whatever you used previously. I'm going to go back to black on this. Uh, my font is Trajan Pro 3. Don't know what that looks like at the moment. Just what I used last time. 
I'm just gonna type oh my gosh that's tiny okay India Indianapolis I totally mistyped that I have no idea what I typed actually it's probably terrible but that's okay now you can't see that that's because this is way too small if you look at the top of your toolbar up here it'll show you your font that it's regular versus bold or whatever options you have available this right here is the point size of that font so set your font size if you go to where the, the small t and the capital t are you can see your little icon shows up like a little thumb or finger pointer with two arrows off the side of it you can just click right there and drag left or right and of course it's not doing what I want it to do because I don't have anything selected you have to actually I actually did type that right you have to actually have to select the text and then do this there we go side side point I'm scrolling in and out using the scroll wheel on the middle of my mouse now I'm on a PC if you're on a Mac and it doesn't have a scroll wheel you can use the zoom tool down here which is click in click in click in click in zoom in and if you hold down alt or option key and click you'll see the center of it turns to a minus sign so you can zoom out so that's how you zoom in and out the hard way depending on your preferences settings you can just click and drag left or right to zoom in if you click and hold and drag left it zooms out zoom, drag right it zooms in or keyboard shortcuts control and the plus zooms in command on a Mac or control minus command minus zooms out now I said plus and minus but it's actually equal sign because you would have to have shift don't worry about the shift key on this so that lets you zoom in and out if you need to select that text and again to do that you want to have your text tool so clicked and just kind of hover above the text if you're off here you can see it's like this square with a little text icon in the middle of it if, once you're up in the text and can select it the out outer square goes away so you just click and drag and you can highlight that whole thing oh my gosh that was a bot that was a lot I hope you didn't get completely lost there come up here just drag right until you get whatever size text you want and if you come out here while all that is selected you'll see your icon changes to this little pointer with a cross arrows you can click and drag this around to relocate it something like so okay once you have that figured out and like where it's at just click the checkbox up here and that will save it and now we have this saying Indianapolis on the top of it so now Indianapolis is a text layer above your background layer we can do lots of things to this text layer to edit it but just to create something fun give you the basic idea of working with text files and layer styles one of the most common things people like to do with text is either create a glow or a shadow around it so let's do that go up to layer and layer style and you'll see lots and lots and lots and lots of options we're just gonna go with uh, do I want to do outer glow do I want to do a drop shadow let's go with drop shadow and you can see my last drop shadow really actually wasn't a shadow so let me reset all of this it should probably I don't know what the default is on that but we're gonna go back to black okay all right so the blending mode we'll talk about blending modes later on but it may say something like multiply or normal whatever the default is just don't worry about that opacity obviously changes how opaque or how solid looking that shadow is distance pushes it further back away from your text based on the angle that you have selected so if you want to shift the direction of that shadow you can do that 
spread does some weird kind of thickening of that and size makes it a either sharp hard-edged shadow or kind of turns it into a gray mess eh. uh, I want it to look like the letters but not be completely sharp so I'm gonna go size around 10 and again this may be different different depending on the actual size of the letters that you ended up with um, and just bring that distance back in so it's more like that okay now you can actually just click out here and drag it around manually if you want to so that is an option as well and once you have that done just click OK now there is a shortcut now you'll see that there's effects added in here so it has this effect with the eyes next to it so you can turn the visibility of that effect on and off and it says drop shadow now if you want to bring that layer style menu back up without going through the layer menu you can just double click on the gray area of this Indianapolis text layer like well like so yes and it will bring up that same layer style menu and you can see the drop shadow down here is check marked now like I said there's lots of other options in here you're welcome to play with these and see what they all do we'll probably get into a few more of these later on but for now um, I was just showing you the basic idea of creating a drop shadow so you may have already caught this maybe not but this is a question that comes up a lot in your layer menu here you have opacity and fill now if we go back to our little whatever purple swoosh thing that we did and we start playing with opacity it changes the overall opacity of the entire layer versus the layer mask which you know you could change based on painting with gray and whatever this affects the entire layer but if we adjust fill it looks like it's doing exactly the same thing and on this layer it is there's really no difference if it's just a layer with some color in it opacity and fill will work pretty much the same way but if we go to our text layer I'm going to turn that one off and turn the text back on because we have this drop shadow effect fill will actually change how it functions if you reduce the fill it will reduce the opacity of the text that you originally typed but not change that drop shadow effect so watch what happens you can bring it down to where you only have that drop shadow effect so it's this subtle little shadow floating up there in the sky that says Indianapolis which that's pretty cool all right so that's one of the ways that fill will work differently from opacity on these layers now you can you know change the overall opacity as well so that that drop shadow becomes really really subtle um, so you know you're welcome to play with that and see what you think uh, when we get into talking about a or uh, blending modes layer blending modes there are certain blending modes that also interact a little bit differently with fill but that's beyond the scope of what we're talking about right at this moment but I like the way that looks now that I see I might want to move this text over just a little bit so the move tool is this little cross pointer up at the very top you can just click and drag I think yeah you can center things up that way because with the move tool you'll get a little highlight purple line that says okay now it's in the middle of the image and I think that looks pretty decent okay so we're gonna stop this one for now if you want to save it I'll show you what's gonna happen here if you go to file and save as now you have a Photoshop document because we have layers in our file it won't save as a JPEG because JPEG does not support layers there's only a few file types that do uh, TIFF is another one so if you um, see a TIFF file that is usually a larger file size and it supports the layers as well Photoshop usually will default to its PSD document which is Photoshop document 
that has all the layers and everything saved in it. You can, if you have a whole bunch of things, you may run into it saying, I can't save that as a PSD. Do you want to save it as a PSB large format document? It's limited to four gigabytes as a, yeah, four gigabytes as a PSD. PSB works the same way. It's just a larger format. Um, so you can, if you want to, go ahead and save it. You know, Indianapolis Skyline text. Great. That is now saved. And we'll have that file. But if you want to save this as a JPEG, you can do that. Save as JPEG. But if you save it as a JPEG, it's going to what what is called flatten the image. So it's going to take all of the layers that you've gotten and just smash it all down into one single layer and save it as a JPEG. If you decide later you want to go and open that file and edit it, if you didn't save it as a layered document, either Photoshop or TIFF file, you won't have any of those layers to work with. It will just be the finished flat image of everything that you did. So be careful when you're saving your files. If you want to go back and edit them, you want to make sure that you're saving it as a Photoshop document or TIFF. If you're saving it to post on Facebook or websites or anything like that, you're going to want to save it as a JPEG because websites and Facebook and all these social media things don't support Photoshop documents. So those are kind of the two main file types that we'll be working with. There's lots of others. PNG is another one that is a lot is, is popular for a lot of uh, web graphics and that kind of stuff. So there are some differences there. But mainly you just want to understand that JPEG files are completely flattened, compressed files that don't support any layers. So any layer information that you have will be thrown out. Whereas a Photoshop document will retain all of that so you can come back and keep editing it later. Okay, that was a lot of information. So we talked about making some adjustments to this uh, sunrise image to maybe increase the saturation of the sky without really blowing out the uh, the building and the signs or reducing the saturation of this green grass without killing the sunrise. So let's let's look at doing that. You can if you have your adjustments tab open here in the middle and if you don't have it you want to go up to window and make sure your adjustments setting here is check marked so the check box is on and if it is and you still don't see it look for tabs like this that show where that might be. Yeah, I love the traffic around here. So once you have that, the hue and saturation adjustment is this one kind of in the middle on the left that looks like some various squares inside of a rectangle here. So you just click that and it will create a hue and saturation layer above your text layer or actually it creates it above whatever layer you had selected so if you were had clicked on the background layer it would show up right above the background but I had the text layer selected so it's showing up above there one thing we'll get into keep in mind that a, an adjustment layer unless you mask it affects everything underneath it so if our text had color to it and I made this hue and saturation adjustment to it it would affect the text as well as the background image. So let's just play with that, right? You can see that this has an icon that looks like a split circle as well as a layer mask. And remember what we did with the layer mask. It, If you paint it in black, it hid it from affecting your image. So if we click on this little split circle, Double click on it. Yes. Oh. Ah. It's in the properties. I'm used to it popping up as a window like this. So I click and drag this out here. It shows up because I had it inside of there. It was showing up right next to where the adjustments are. So 
wherever you see this, these are the adjustments for that hue and saturation. Okay. So let's start by reducing the um, saturation of the grass. So we want to remember go to the yellow channel in this master channels list and then just reduce the saturation maybe about negative 60, 59, somewhere in there. So it's still a little green, but not super green. Now, click on the mask icon of that hue and saturation layer. Go to your paintbrush. And then make sure you have black selected. And you want to make sure the opacity of your brush is 100%. We haven't really talked about that, but you can change the opacity of your brush up here. Um, flow should be 100% too. Um, and then you can just paint in here over where the sun is. And your left and right bracket keys, right above the inner key, will change the size of your paintbrush. So if you want to make it bigger so you can paint things a little bit faster, just hit the right bracket a few times and it will come back. So now you can see I'm painting back in all the yellow tones that were in the sky, but the green grass is still not as green. And you can see, if you look at your little layer mask icon, the top portion of it is mostly black, and then below that is white. So black, again, hides that effect where it's white, the adjustment, the change that we did to the hue and saturation is showing or affecting the image. Okay? Cool. Let's make another one. So we go back to your adjustments, click on hue and saturation again. This time in here, we want to again make sure you click on the little split circle because if you click on the layer mask icon, you're going to get the weird layer mask adjustments. So we want to make sure we have that circle. And now we're going to go to our blues on that channel list and increase the saturation. All right. Now again, I don't really like the way it looks on the building in these signs, so I'm going to click on the layer mask. We still have black selected. I'm going to change the brush size down here a little bit and reduce it back down and just come in here and as carefully as I can hit the building and then sweep across these signs. And you can go back and forth with black or black and white. Again, use the X key to switch back and forth on those. And anything in here that you don't want to be more saturated in blue, paint over that with black. Some of the pillars on the bottom of this bridge are kind of bluish too. So now we have those two layers and you can turn them on and off with the visibility icon here so you can see the, the difference that it makes. And if you think, well, that's great, but maybe I made it too saturated on blue. Well, there's you can click on this and then you have to go back to the blues and you can see it still has that change made. So you can go back after the fact and change it. Whereas when we actually were working on just our background layer image and went through the image adjustments and made that change, it actually wrote it into the pixels so that it was set that way in the image. This is part of non-destructive editing because you can come back to the adjustment layer and readjust any of these sliders. You could also come back here and just say, I wanna reduce the opacity of that effect so it has a similar um, thing as going back and reducing that saturation. Uh, either way, whatever makes sense to you. Um, if you have a whole lot of different effects that are added to it, like you've changed the saturation on three different channels and boosted the lightness in one channel, lots of different effects, and you're just like, well, that's just too much overall. I like the effect, but it's just too much overall. That's where I would say, okay, just come in here and reduce the overall opacity of that layer versus trying to fiddle with all those individual sliders again. So. Real quick, I think we've done a pretty cool job of enhancing this image overall. Maybe you decide, I don't like the desaturated green grass, I want to bring it back up and make it even more saturated. Go for it. 
It's whatever makes sense to you. I'm just using this to show you and demonstrate the uh, different adjustments and how they can work for you. One thing I do want to point out real quick, and we'll get more into this, but so don't dwell on it at this point, but the layer order matters. You know, at, at this point, all we've done are some different hue and saturation adjustments, but where these sit in your stack of layers in Photoshop makes a difference. Anything at the very top, if you make a hue and saturation adjustment at the very top of all of your layers, it's going to affect everything beneath it. If you make a hue and saturation adjustment somewhere in the middle of all these different layers that you've put together, it will affect everything below it, but nothing above it. And there is one special little technique when we get into compositing where you can actually link an adjustment layer to a specific layer so that it only affects that one and nothing else. So we'll get into that, but keep that in mind. The order in which your layers are stacked makes a difference in how they interact with everything else in your image. Go ahead and save this file. If you want to share it in our group, uh, save it as a JPEG, post it, and let me know what you've learned, what made sense, what maybe didn't make so much sense. Or if you're struggling with it and you've only gotten halfway through this and just save it as it is, and share that and tag me and say, hey, David, I need help. Can you explain this a little bit more? I'd be happy to do so. Look forward to seeing you in the next one. We're going to dive into actually creating our first little basic composite.